What's going on guys? We are tongue punching fart boxes with Alan Aragon. That is how he opened up his presentation here at the UEBC yesterday. This dude does not fuck around. <laughs> you all better like the video for that intro. <laughs> yes, like, <laughs> and, share. Yeah, all, all that uh, <laughs> social media, you know, jazz. Um, but we're here with Alan to talk about his presentation. Um, Alan, you gave everybody a rundown of everything you've learned in the nutrition field over the past 10 years. Roughly. Roughly. Give or take a decade. Yeah, yeah the, the stuff I found to be most interesting, I probably left out a lot of stuff just in the interest of uh, time. Mm. So. Yeah, and I guess, you know, where do we start? Let's talk about our carbohydrates. Yeah, carbohydrates are, are loved and hated. Mm. Um, it's been a lot of uh, research for and against certain protocols and a lot of <laughs> tribes and camps that were formed based around the idea of hating carbs or loving them. And of course, uh, all we're left to do is look at the weight of the evidence, see what it says, you know, mm -hmm. see what uh, contexts apply to certain claims, and then look at the science and see see how that pans out. So yeah, very controversial these uh, carbohydrates. Yeah, and you sort of picked apart uh, all of the different, I guess, theories or uh, methodologies and approaches to carbohydrates. Mm -hmm. and, and one thing that was a reoccurring theme throughout your presentation was you know, showing the weight of the evidence, mm -hmm. you know, that, hey, yes, amino acids have been shown to, you know, improve performance and, you know, muscle growth, and there was four studies, but then there was nine studies showing mm -hmm. that, you know, amino acids may not be effective, um, you know, in that context. Um, so I guess, you know, why is it so important for people to look to all of the evidence as opposed to just one study? And in yeah. what cases can one study be a game changer in the sense that it, it's more valid than say three other studies mm -hmm. and that was something that I thought was quite interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, in the case of um, let's say high carb versus low carb dieting, uh, there are probably dozens of studies showing the superiority of the low carb diet condition for improving a number of parameters whether they be clinical parameters or whether they be body composition parameters. Mm -hmm. But then somebody came along and decided, you know what, we really need to compare diets that match protein yeah. and total calories. And then we are truly isolating that variable of carb fat proportion um, without giving one side the advantage of having more protein and thus the advantage of having a higher thermic effect, higher satiating effect, and greater uh, muscle preserving effect. So once those studies started rolling in, it pretty much invalidates like everything. All, <laughs> all of the studies that don't match protein and don't match total calories. Mm -hmm. uh, but then there's an, another little wrinkle that comes in here where we need to test more diets or we need to compare more diets that are truly ketogenic versus non-ketogenic. Very low carb. Very low yeah. carb, yeah, very low carb versus whatever, moderate carb, high carb, and see how that spontaneously impacts um, appetite levels. Mm. Because there's an interesting body of literature showing that ketogenic diets, through whatever mechanisms it might be, maybe inherently the elevated levels of ketones themselves, or the decreased level of food reward, or just the... Mm. Just the, the sh shittiness of the diet itself that demotivates people from, from wanting to eat. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that would be uh, an interesting area to explore and see whether that spontaneous reduction in caloric intake in the ketogenic side would be something that persists beyond the first few months. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And you also talked about uh, supplementation, which mm -hmm. I thought was really interesting. You uh, used the uh, continuum of, you know, I guess training qualities from strength to hypertrophy to endurance yes. and, you know, obviously creatine, big tick, but there was a, a hell of a lot of supplements that, you know, are in the hypertrophy uh, realm that you have seen to be, uh, you know, deemed effective based on the literature. Well, do you want to give the guys a rundown of those? Yeah, yeah. So nobody watching this does cardio, <laughs> so we don't need to worry about the endurance. No, 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 not too much, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, on, on the strength endurance continuum, uh, pure strength and power stuff, creatine, Pretty much as a slam dunk for that stuff, and then there are there's a mixed body of data showing whether creatine will affect the middle portion of the pure strength power all the way to the pure endurance thing, and creatine uh, 
tends to falter as you get closer towards the endurance side of okay. the continuum. But for sure, strength power stuff, and for sure, stuff that's teetering on more of the um, early mid range, creatine is a is a solid bet for that. Mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of the strength endurance continuum, you have stuff like uh, beta alanine, um, sodium bicarbonate. And then you have a couple of maybes that were coming up in the literature, but then we started seeing equivocal data on things like uh, nitrate supplementation and things like citrulline malate. Uh, so those are maybes. But again, for uh, one of the definites at the midpoint would be caffeine. So <laughs> caffeine is one of those uh, uh, all-star players where it covers a, um, a wider range of the strength and, and strength endurance continuum than the other types of supplements. And uh, as I mentioned in the lecture, well, caffeine is really the only one that's a drug out of these uh, right. supplements that we're talking about. And of course, nobody really cares about endurance sports, but you know, it's easy enough to remember that uh, electrolyte, carbohydrate, typical sports yeah, beverages, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, those things will help provide carbohydrate availability when glycogen availability starts running yeah. out towards the end of an endurance training bout. And then of course, caffeine will always work. Yes. <laughs> awesome. So, yeah. And towards the back end of your presentation, you talked about amino acids, protein, um, and something I thought was really interesting was the dosing of protein uh, when you're hypocaloric versus hypercaloric. Yeah. And I think yeah. a lot of the attendees would have uh, been taken aback that when you're when you're dieting, maybe we don't need to have uh, our protein, you know, evenly dispersed uh, as we do when we're gaining. So do you want to talk about that? Yeah, man. Um, that that is kind of an interesting story because uh, uh, my colleagues and I actually ran a randomized control trial that looked at um, uh, that looked at the timing of of protein relative to the resistance training bout, mm -hmm. and there was an unintended caloric deficit that happened in that training study, and so we didn't aim to discover this, mm -hmm. but really the timing did not affect. Um, body composition between groups, like they both retain muscle, both lost fat, regardless of the timing mm. of, uh, of the protein dose. So um, that was sort of an interesting uh, unintended finding and stuff. Yeah. And so really with, with a caloric deficit, if the goal is to ma mainly lose body fat, the body is much more resilient and, and sort of uh, non-discriminating about the distribution of the intake of, of protein over the course of the day, whether you get it in in two meals or whether you get it in at 12. 12 meals a day. <laughs> Which is probably why limited fasting has been seen to be getting such good results, yes. um, even though you have a smaller you know, feeding window, and it's probably not ideal in a massing phase, but who really wants to restrict calories with a shorter window when they're gaining, right? Right, there's there's practical limits to the, yeah. to the permutations you can think of. You can think of all kinds of odd things, but ultimately it comes down to practicality and what, mm. what most people will be able to tolerate and not. And it has been really interesting to see very low meal frequency uh, being, you know, pretty pretty accommodating for the preservation of lean mass. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that we wouldn't necessarily hypothesize, but once we run the trials and we see that people are just eating every other day and maintaining lean body mass, it's mm -hmm. like, and this is even without resistance training, yeah. we kind of really kind of get this reinforcement that the body is really good at surviving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, not it's not necessarily good at growing. Mm. But at surviving, yeah. And you know, why is it more important when we're trying to grow that we dose these protein uh, feedings more evenly? Mm, yeah, the body has a very tight regulation on um, short-term anabolic events that happen. Otherwise, we just grow out of control, and, and that would <laughs> that would compromise a, a lot. We of look things. like Mike Isertel, <laughs> right? <laughs> we look like good old Dr. Mike. Um, so you know, the the body has a way of, of short-circuiting muscle protein synthesis, and regardless of the amount of protein you hit it with in, in a single sitting. And that pretty much mainly has to do with, uh, with survival. You know, if, um, if we were designed to pack on muscle really fast and lots of muscle in a, in a single unit of time, then we'd require more energy to support that muscle. And then uh, in times of famine and stuff, you know, that, that, that would be the exact opposite mm. of what we'd be supported to do. So. I think that it just kind of makes sense from the survival of the organism type of thing that uh, you know the body doesn't necessarily want yeah. to, to want to grow so huge and have such massive energy requirements. Yeah, fantastic. And one question I want to ask you this weekend was, what have you learned? What has been one thing that you have learned over the weekend? Uh, well, this one isn't necessarily new, but 
Australian audiences are jacked. <laughs> Guys are some of the most jacked audiences in the world. Maybe the most jacked, maybe right up there with uh, Norway or something. No. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, something I learned. That's a tough one, man. Um, uh, I, I learned that I, I agree a lot with, with the rest of the presenters. Mm. Uh, like when, when Sohi Lee, she presented on uh, some of the psychological side of things, I was happy to see her uh, mention that the ultimate goal for the general population as far as dieting goes should be intuitive eating, should be eating on the basis of uh, internal cues of hunger and satiety, yeah. right? Physiological cues rather than emotional cues or habit cues and things like that. Mm. But she also said that, you know, if you're not there yet, it's okay. You need to run, yeah. It's it's okay. That's a learnable thing. It doesn't have to, you don't have to, you know, achieve that 100%, otherwise you fail. You know, there, there are some people who are going to have a combination of micromanaging this mm -hmm. and, uh, and, you know, macromanaging or intuitive eating, and that's totally fine. It's wherever you're at along your uh, continuum of yeah. development. Yeah. That's cool. Progress is progress. So I thought that was a good way to present it. Awesome. Awesome. Guys, make sure you uh, check out Alan. Subscribe to his research review, the Alan Aragon Research Review. He puts out uh, publications monthly. I've been subscribed personally for like three or four years now, probably longer, and it's a phenomenal resource. Alan? Thank you so much. Thank you, my man. Thank you.